hearts and your minds for worship. God, we're so grateful that you've allowed us to gather here once again. Uh, we pray that you have your way in this place, God, and that your spirit dwells and speaks to us. Uh, God, we're uh, looking for an experience and encounter with you this morning. We love and adore you. We're so very excited about what you're doing in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.
welcome to the service of worship at Westminster United Methodist Church. When you came in, you should have gotten a connection card. If you've been with us for a while, you know that this is a way of keeping attendance, keeping track of who's here, and also your way of letting us know what questions you have, what prayer concerns you have, things you might be interested in. So if you did not get one in a few minutes, we're going to have a great time. You're welcome to go to the back and grab one. The second card that's out there is this card, and this is our service card. Some of you have already turned it in, and it's so that's fantastic. If you have not turned it in or if you don't know what this is, go back and grab one during the greeting time. We're going to be talking about it a little bit later in the service. Friends, uh, would you stand up and greet one another in the name of Christ? Try this at home. <laughs> I try. I can't get it back in there. Just 
brought back. So we want to remember that Jesus tells us that what is so powerful? Our tongue, and we have to be careful with it, okay? We have to be careful, and we can ask Jesus to help us with it, okay? So we're going to say a prayer. Ready? <laughs> this, is, this is how I like to pray. Can you show me your wiggly fingers? Okay, say it. we're going to say it with me, and grown-ups, y'all can maybe remember this. We're going to say, open and shut. Open and shut. Give your hands a clap. Open and shut. Open and shut. Put your praying hands in your lap. Dear God. Please help me with my powerful tongue. Help me to use it to say kind words and make others feel better. Amen. Can we set up a two-person station right up there with all this good news to this? Um, I don't know what he's talking about, I've never done that. What we talked about last week 
was the introduction to what was going on in the background. So if you missed that sermon, I would encourage you to go check it out on the website because the theological background behind all of this is this tension within the early church of what to do about the fact that God seems to be including Gentile believers without converting them to Judaism first. This is, this is new. This is a curveball. This has never before been conceived of in the history of Israel. Um, Israel's God always did something with the Gentiles, but the Jews were his chosen family, his special people, and in order for be, people to be uh, considered a part of the family of God, they would have to go through a very complex initiation process, which started with circumcision, but then extended to a whole lot of lifestyle changes. Imagine the lifestyle changes you would undergo if you were becoming Amish. That is about the level of lifestyle changes that we are talking about from a Gentile to become a Jew. And so the background of the theological issue presenting is that Paul is arguing that none of those changes are necessary. None of those changes are necessary. What we're getting into today is why he thinks they're unnecessary and what the implications of that are. And he, we're, we've got several more weeks, but what we're really going to hone in on today is comes from Galatians 2, where he makes his first statement about why he thinks they're unnecessary. And then he starts to tease out the implications of if you really think this is unnecessary, this is what this means. And so I'm going to read for you, I'm just going to read it, and then we're going to kind of tease it apart in the sermon. Galatians 2, starting with verse 15. Now the background to this passage, Paul tells his story. He tells how he was converted, he used to persecute the Christians, he was converted by a vision of Jesus. Then he began preaching to the uncircumcised and the Gentiles. Then he went and met with the Jews to make sure he had correct theology. Uh, when, when Paul is saying the Jews and the Gentiles, he's talking about Christians, right? He's talking about Jewish Christians or Gentile Christians. So he met with the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem, and they all agreed they were proclaiming the same gospel. And then he, he tells a story about when he met Peter and corrected him. And this is, this is a story of, imagine two huge big name leaders in the church, and imagine one publicly confronting the other. That's what's happening here. And the story is that Paul and Peter had both agreed that Gentiles did not need to become Jews, that Gentiles uh, had a few rules they had to follow, but other than that, they were already filled with the Spirit, which meant that they were already part of the family of God, they were already part of what God was doing in Christ, and therefore they were part of the community, and therefore they were eating together freely. And so Paul and Peter had already agreed that everyone could eat together freely. And then, and then, there was a special meeting to which many of the more conservative elements of the Jewish faction were invited, the more Jewish Christian faction were invited, who still believed very deeply in keeping every part of the law, including the laws against Jew and Gentile eating together. And so for this meeting, there were set up two tables. One table with anything on it, because those Gentiles just eat anything. And the other table with strict kosher food for only the Torah keeping Jews to eat. And of course, the Gentiles were not allowed to sit at the Jewish table because Jews and Gentiles are not allowed to eat together. And Peter, who before had been had been eating with the Gentiles, when that faction arrived and he felt the pressure from these people who he had grown up with, he went back to eat at the Jewish table. That is the presenting, the, the kind of straw that breaks the camel's back that makes Paul go on and write Galatians, right? <laughs> that is what sets everything off. And so Paul tells the story about getting up in the middle of the dinner, going over to Peter, publicly confronting him. You can tell what like a nice, socially adapted guy Paul was at this point. <laughs> he's the guy you want at your party. Um, he does this stuff all the time, right? Because he's more, he's always thinking theologically. He's always thinking about what are, what's the implication of what you're doing. And his point to Paul Peter is like, this is not innocuous. You are making a theological declaration and you are wrong. And so here's what he says to Peter. First he confronts them about why are you doing this? Before this you were eating with the Gentiles. And then he, he weaves directly into a theological argument. 
We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Yet we know that a person is justified, that word justified means made right with. A person is made right with God, not by the works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. Now I want you to notice that line and the fact that he said, we know. He's not debating this point, he is stating it as a fact that is already agreed upon among the apostles. Which means that from the earliest proclamations of the gospel, whether among Jew or Gentile, everyone agreed on this fact. A person is made right with God, not through works of the law, but by faith in Christ. That's a, that's a pretty extraordinary statement to make, but the fact that they had already agreed on it at this point tells us that this is probably the earliest proclamation. The earliest Christian understanding of the gospel. We are made right with God. God has has reconciled the world to make it right with himself, and it doesn't have to do with law and Torah and teaching. It has to do with trusting Christ. And through trusting Christ, we are made right with God. And then he immediately dives into the implications. And we have come to believe in Jesus Christ so that we might be made right by faith in Christ, not by doing the works of the law, because no one will be made right by the works of the law. But in our effort to be made right in Christ, we ourselves have been found to be sinners. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Of course not. If I build up everything, again, the very things I once tore down, but that I demonstrate I am a transgressor. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not nullify the grace of God, for if justification, making right, comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. All right. You got it? You good? We're good. That was a whole lot of words. That's what the sermon's going to be on, is what all those words mean. Because Paul starts with this very, very easy argument, and he's like, also, blah. And he gives, like, one of the most nuanced, complex. If you want to hear scholars disagree with themselves, look up the interpretation of these few verses. Because he has so many garbled thoughts within there right next to each other. Even in Greek, it doesn't necessarily make more sense than it does in English. Because it's almost like he's thinking and speaking so quickly, he says all this stuff together. So what I want to do with you over the sermon is I want to tease out some of the themes that we hear in those three verses. Not only because I think understanding those verses gets easier when you read the whole book as a whole, but also because when you put Galatians and Romans together, you hear Paul's thought fully drawn out. Because when he wrote Romans, he was a little bit calmer. He had some chamomile tea first, and was actually able to get his theology out rather than just like bleh, spluttering it out in a few sentences. The basic theological tenet here that Paul is trying to get across in this Galatians 2 is this, because we are saved by faith, by grace, through faith, everything is changed, everything is different now. And working out the implications of how it is different is what is going to fundamentally make Christianity what Christianity became. I'm going to tease out for you three implications I see. There are a whole lot more. There's, this is one of those passages where there's probably a dozen sermons, if not more, you can preach from them. I'm going to tease out three implications I see. The implications not only that directly affected the early church, but implications I think that affect you and me and the way that we are living out our lives today. First implication is this. Getting right with Christ does not come from following rules. Getting right with Christ does not come from following rules. Christianity, the technical term is that Christianity is not a religion of orthopraxy, doing the right things. It's a religion of orthodoxy, knowing the right things things. Now that is, makes the people, the Jewish Christians who are hearing this incredibly uncomfortable. Because what it meant to be a person of God fundamentally was not what was in your heart and in your head, it was what you did. And if you did the right things in your heart and your head would follow, and of course they didn't care about the heart and the head, but it was fundamentally, you could tell a Jewish person by how they dressed, how they ate, how they acted, how they behaved, all of the things were what made you a part of the family of God. 
I mean, again, think about the Amish. You can tell an Amish person by how they dress, how they eat. All of this is what makes you a part of that community. And there's at some point, when you take the, the faiths that are really based in orthopraxy, there's, some, there's a point to which they'll even say, like, you know what, they might believe this, we might believe this, but we're all together on the fact that we don't wear cotton, that we don't drink coffee, that we don't X, Y, Z. As the more I talk about this, the more you realize that there are lots of other faiths around the world that are orthopraxy. And it doesn't really matter what's in your head nearly as much as what you do because it is the actions that you do that matter to make you a part of the family of God. All of that goes out the window for Christians and Galatians. So if you are looking for a faith that is fundamentally based in following rules, unfortunately, that is what Paul is taking away from you here. <laughs> Paul is making the argument in Galatians that getting right with God does not come from rule following. Getting right with God does not come from rule following. It doesn't mean he thinks rules are bad. It doesn't mean he thinks Christians should be immoral. In fact, you'll notice in the arguments he makes, does this mean Christians can just do whatever they want to? Of course not, because X, Y, Z. It means the rules themselves are not what make us right with God. Here is why that unsettles us. Humans like rules. Humans like following rules. Humans like having it clear in and out so that I know whatever happens, if I put on this set of clothing, if I do this thing, if I eat this food and not this food, I know that I am in. And Paul is saying that's not how it works. That's not how it works. When I was, um, I've got two young uh, niece and a nephew. When they were very young, my nephew was very into rules. He liked to know how the world worked. And he knew, um, the, so we were camping once, and we had a, we were at a picnic table, and there was no plates, because we didn't bring plates to eat on. And my mother, who was much more sensitive to the presence of germs than my family is, was taking lids off the food so that we could eat on the lids. And my little nephew, who was probably four at the time, knew that that's not how lids worked, right? The rule is that the lid goes on top of the container, not underneath the food. And so he kept going behind her and taking the lid up and putting it back on the container. And it's, and it's because and he would get very, very frustrated because in his head, this rule is because lids go on containers. Now, he's not old enough for my mother to explain, okay, yes, lids you normally go on containers, but behind that rule is a principle. And the principle is that it, lids are in order to keep food in, and sometimes we can use them for other purposes. Because children do not easily understand that rules can have multiple purposes. So I notice this with my own children, I have to be very specific in the way I word rules. No, we are not allowed to put our hands in the toilet. But sometimes, if you just dumped all of mommy's things into that, we have to put our hands in the toilet in order to get them out. I remember when Annabelle threw a fit when I put my hand in the toilet to get out the thing that she had just put into it because the rule is you don't put your hand in the toilet. You just got an insight how the mill's household functions. <laughs> the rule is, and of course the adults here are saying, okay, the principle of the rule is normally you don't do that, but of course in, a, in an emergency you do. Here's the thing, y'all. Here's the thing. Humans know that there's a difference between the rule and the principle, but because we are human, we will always go to enforcing the rule no matter what happens with the principle. <clears throat> and what Paul is saying here in Galatians is that's not how it works. And we do it over and over and over again. Trace the history of Christianity. So this started back in the Gospels when Jesus was saying, uh, that they, they were telling him, you cannot heal on the Sabbath because it is forbidden to do work on the Sabbath. And he says, you're missing the point of why the rule for the Sabbath was put into place. The Sabbath was created for man, not man for the Sabbath. If you don't heal on the Sabbath, you are following the rule and ignoring the principle behind the rule. That is, that is pretty much one summary of Jesus' entire interaction with the religious leaders of his time. And so Paul coming out of this is saying, oh, yo, the rules are not what is making us right with God. And it would be one thing if we hit Galatians and that tendency to create rules and stick to them to death to us part had gotten out of humanity, but it didn't because you 
look at the history of the church ever since then, and we keep building up new rules, particularly rules that are divorced from the principles that we see in the gospel. By the time Martin Luther read this, what was necessary for salvation was not faith in Christ. What was necessary for salvation was taking communion a certain number of times, saying confession a certain number of times, paying a certain amount of money to get out of purgatory, um, saying a certain number of prayers the right way, lighting a certain number of candles. All of those things in and of themselves not necessarily bad, but the lining, adding up rules on top of what is necessary, and Paul says none of it makes you right with Christ. None of the rules are what's going to matter. Now, for my rule followers out there, if I'm making you nervous, that means you're beginning to get what Galatians is all about. Galatians is supposed to make you nervous. Galatians is the most unsettling book of the New Testament because it takes everything that has been built up and says, Christ has torn this down. Christ has torn this down. You are made right with Christ because of what Christ did and because you trust in Christ, not because you are a rule follower. So first implication, getting right with Christ, getting right with God does not come from following rules. Second implication is this, identity. Identity is found in Christ alone. Now, why is this so important? Because rule following typically is in order to create a sense of identity for us. Right? So you think about um, the Jewish people in this time period following all of those rules wasn't just because they didn't like shellfish. It wasn't just because they didn't like wearing a certain kind of clothing. It was because you were a part of the people of God. And that identity of being part of the people of God was holistic. It was all of your heart and soul and mind and body and everything. And that gave them a level of pride, right? A level of belonging. What we get from identity as humans is pride and belonging. And you can trace that out, right? It's not just that group that did it. All of these actions that make you a part of a group, that give you a sense of identity, give you a sense of pride, give you a sense of belonging, give you a sense that you are not alone in the world. And here is the problem with that. Paul comes along and says, all of that, all of that was undone. All that was undone. Because if your identity is in Christ, if you were crucified with Christ, then all of a sudden, all you identify, identify not only with the least of these, those who have been crucified, but your identity is solely within Christ, and you are drawn together with others who are in Christ. And that is who you are, not because of what you do, but because there's actually some kind of ontological reality whereby all of us who are in Christ are connected to each other even if we don't know it, even if we don't recognize it. And so to say that you're in Christ, I'm in Christ, we're all connected to each, to each other, and yet, because you are this and you are that, we have to draw a line in the sand and eat separately. Paul is saying, you are fundamentally not recognizing what has already been done. You have already been connected. You have already been connected across Jew and Gentile. And trying to redraw that line is trying to undo what Christ did. Why is this important? Because unfortunately, we did not stop putting all of our eggs into identity buckets in the first century. The thought that we are one in Christ with no division is a thought that has not, in my humble estimation, been fully recognized, been fully lived out in any community over the face of the earth because we are fallen creatures who keep wanting to find our identity in lesser things. And sometimes those are innocuous, and sometimes they are the examples of some of the worst signs of humanity. So in 1787, the African Methodist Episcopal Church was formed. And it was formed because Methodist African Americans left the galley where they were told they should sit, went down to pray at the altar of the church and found out to what lengths the white Methodists would go to enforce segregation. They were physically removed by the ushers, and as one, they got up and they left and they said, fine, we'll make your own church. That was 1787, and that was how the African Methodist Episcopal Church was born. Because the, 
the notion that the identity within Christ covers all of these divisions of identity that we set up for ourselves is still, at that point, had not been heard in that congregation. The problem is I see very, very few congregations that actually get this, maybe none, because humans constantly want to build identity in something else. Constantly want to build a sense of pride and belonging in something other than who we are in Christ. Because somehow that's not enough for us. And if you think we are, we are better off today, if I made you identify based on who you voted for, half of you would leave the room. Because now our levels of identity, our lines in the sand might be different, but they are still there because for some reason Christ is still not enough. And what Galatians says to it, Galatians pushes back. Galatians pushed back in the first century, Galatians pushed back in the 18th century, Galatians pushes back in the 21st century and says, no, who you are in Christ is who you are. And everything else you are trying to construct is artificial. Who you are in Christ is who you are. And if you try to find your pride, your belonging, your self-worth, your identity in anything else, you find yourself building an idol and tearing down the work that God did. Because God made you right by Christ, by grace, through faith. And fundamentally at the level of your being, what is true about you is that you are in Christ. And that's actually the third implication. And this one really is just going to preview next week because this is where he goes for the rest of the book. And that is this, the essence of being in this thing we call Christianity, the essence of being a Jesus follower is being in Christ and Christ being with us. It's not about rule following. It's not really even about getting the sense of us and them and you and me. It is about being suffused with Christ, being filled with the Spirit so that we are made to be people who live by the principles even if we don't take off all of the rules. And so what Paul says in his language is, I have been crucified with Christ, but it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. In his life, I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Now what that looks like and what that means, that's what the rest of the book is going to be about. What does it look like to have Christ living within us? What does it look like to have the Holy Spirit living within us? What does it look like to, to be transformed, to be righted with God, not because of what we do on the outside, but because there actually is somebody on the inside who is changing us from the inside out? What does that look like? That is what he's answering the rest of the book. And so, yes, the rest of the sermons are going to be slightly happier than this one. You can come back and look forward to that. When you hear those, though, don't forget about what we talked about today. Because if you hear those sermons, and you get into the Christ is in me, Christ dwells within me, the Spirit dwells within me, and you do not confront the human tendency to rule following and identity building, we will find ourselves reconstructing the exact same scenario that gave rise to the book of Galatians in the first place, just doing it with different things. So this morning, I want us to confront that so that we'll be free to hear the good news that is coming in the next weeks. Would you join me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, you have proclaimed your gospel to us. You have told us the good news that we are made right with you, not through what we have done, but through what you have done. That we are drawn back to you, not through not through who we are in the world, but through who we are in you. God, we confess that we have wanted to belong by ladder climbing the world. We've wanted to belong by finding accolades in the world. We've wanted to belong in so many different ways, and we confess to you that we are only who we are in you. You are everything. You are everything. Come, Holy Spirit. Bring us to repentance for the ways in which we have replaced you with false identities and pointless rules. And instead, 
draw us deeper into an experience and relationship with you. This we pray as we say together the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For that is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Friends, this is our offering. And if you've been with us for any length of time, you know that this is about more than money because you are more than money. This is a chance for you to go in your heart of hearts and to offer all of yourself back to the God who offered all of himself to you. So if you have a gift, um, we, there's a clear box in the back. You can drop it in on your way out. There's also WUMC.com where you can give online. But in the next few minutes, we ask you to consider what it looks like to give all of you. Your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, and your witness. Back to the God who gave all of himself to you. Thank you. 